before you, Father God, with our hands open. And we just say we are ready to receive whatever you have for us. And we just say that we love you, Jesus.
And I feel like the Lord said, He's saying, I, I've got this, I've taken it. I sealed it up, and when the time comes, yesterday and the day before that and the day before that he asked me the question that I never have an answer for which is what are you going to call this message <laughs> you remember that's my least favorite thing to do and uh, so I'm like God <laughs> and you know what There's, there's so much coming out today that it was really, really hard to try to put it into one phrase. But um, I put my little head down and I said, what should I call this? And he said, just a minute, I got to make a bit of noise here. The only thing that matters right now. Because if you want to be pedantic, you could say, well, the only thing that matters is that you give your heart to Jesus. And it's like, well, then the only thing that matters after that is that you actually follow him. And then there's the only, you know, it's like, yeah, so we won't be pedantic about it. But right now in this season, there's only one thing that matters. Now, last week, um, I felt like the Lord said something to me um, just when we were finishing up worship practice. And the girls each had something on their hearts. And so I just thought, well, I'll leave it. And God said, you can share that next week. And I'm like, okay. And Brent's preaching. Now, Noel said two, week, two weeks before that, he said, you have to use the word of the Lord. You've got to deal with the idols in your life. So then I preached the next week, and I'm talking about um, how God's bringing the Israelites out of Egypt and how there's three plagues, and then there's seven more plagues, and how the second plague was the frogs, and, they were, and, and it was, would you worship a frog? I personally would not pick a frog. I don't totally understand why, but for some reason, they're worshiping frogs. Which is why when Moses said to Pharaoh, when do you want me to get rid of them? Pharaoh said, mm -hmm. I would have said immediately. I would have, I would have said like 10 hours ago. But he said tomorrow. Because he didn't want to let go, quite because he knew this is my God. And we'll, we'll explain a little bit about it. But... So I said, we have to find out what the frogs are in our lives. What are those things that we worship that aren't God? And then we all went home from church and probably forgot about it, didn't we? I know that we did because Brent gets up to preach last week and he says, by the way, what are the frogs? We need to identify the frogs. So this is like three weeks in a row gotten. Are we slow? Not slower than anybody else. But this is kind of a, a thing that comes through scripture all the time. It's God repeats himself till we get it. So I was like, okay. So then I'm like, I'll share that thing. And God said, as Brent's preaching, I'm thinking, what if he keeps saying to me, he kept saying, you know, get rid of your frogs, get rid of your frogs. And I thought, if somebody doesn't go to church and they don't know the story, they'd be like, okay, this is a really church. <laughs> they think everybody in their church has frogs. And he, he, I don't have any frogs. Why is he telling me to get rid of my frogs? So I'm, so I'm in the front doing the wife thing, saying, explain it, honey. But you know, the Holy Spirit just led him to not explain it. And so God said, well, you're preaching next week. And I'm like, no, I'm just sharing that one thing. And he said, no, you need to go back and take a look at this passage. I'm like, okay, no, we're really slow. Everybody just say it. God, we're really slow. Yeah. Actually, we're not slow, but I had shared prophetically how the Lord had said that in this past season, it, it just, everything hit everybody the same. But we're walking into this new season where there's going to be a differentiation between the body of Christ and those that aren't. 
like the plagues came on, the first three plagues came on everybody, and then there was a delineation, and then if you were in, in the children of Israel represents the church. When God talks about Jacob, he's talking about the actual physical Jewish people, but Israel is a picture in the Old Testament of the church in the New Testament. So it, it's like he's went to take Israel out of Egypt, and he, and he calls it Israel. So in that, I was like, yeah, I shared that. He said, no, I want you to go over it again because you didn't. Okay. So I started to read it again. And I started back a little bit, and God shared something with me. So I actually have three parts that I want to share today. So the first thing is, in Exodus 3 and 4, before anything starts, God shows up in the desert and he starts having a conversation with Moses. And God's giving him his assignment. Say, I have an assignment. Okay. And he's giving him his destiny in quite a bit of detail. But Moses wisely continues to interact with God and he has, I have a question about this, but what about this? But what about this? And God clarifies everything. He has no trouble with us troubleshooting. As a matter of fact, if we're actually going to fulfill our destiny and what God created us to do, we need to be having conversations with God. That's normal in the Bible. We start with just kind of hearing his voice a little. I think, I think that was God. And then we talk to him and then we get smarter and we talk less and we listen more. But asking questions is vital in any relationship. And so he's God lets him troubleshoot. He didn't scold him. He, he had no issue with it at all. Go ahead. And then when he's answered all of Moses' question about his destiny and his future, Moses comes up with this. He disqualifies himself. He's like, I'm slow of speech and I have an awkward tongue. And God's response was like, oh my goodness, thank you for pointing that out. I don't know how I totally missed that. Of course you can't do this. <laughs> Actually, God's response was like, no, I made you. I know how you speak. We just had a conversation. I know what you sound like when you talk, Moses. As a matter of fact, I've been listening to you for 80 years. And he says, I will be with your mouth. What does that mean? Like that's, a, that's where you go, God, did I just hear you say I will be with your mouth? And there's a story of Benny Hinnon, and he's been in ministry for a long time, but he gave his heart to Jesus when he was about 16 or 17 years old, and he was so in love with Jesus that he would come home from work or school or whatever it is, and he'd hightail it to his bedroom and close the door because his family really wasn't saved. They were Egyptian. And so this giving your life to Jesus was not like a cool thing to do. And he just, when he got in his room, because he, he just like, I just want to be with you. The presence of God was so strong in his room. And he did that for months. And then all of a sudden, a friend of his, like he started hanging out with a group of people, and they said, hey, Benny, will you preach in church this Sunday? And Benny Hinn has a stutter of all stutters. And so he's thinking, and he says to the guy, I stutter. And he goes, well, I felt like God said to ask you. So he goes back into his room with the Holy Spirit, and he said, you know I stutter. And if I can make it past the first line without them laughing, I'll do my best. And he came up, and he started to preach. And the minute he opened his mouth, the stutter stopped, and it never came back. So it could have been like that for Moses. Or it could have been just so much that people looked at it, really, this, this, and then God does, and they go, wow, from somebody who stutters. He said, I'll be with you, Ralph, and I will teach you what to say. Moses says, please pick someone else. And God. So my question this morning is, what is your self disqualifying phrase because self-disqualifying phrases are not just lies are you ready for it they're frogs 
If lies control your life, your actions, your time, your words, and you live your life according to the lie, if you obey the lie, it's an idol. The lie is your God. The lie is a frog. Did you follow that? It's actually pretty much a given that God's going to ask us to do something we can't do. Just throwing that out there for your enjoyment this morning. It's just his, because then it's God and not us. So it says the Lord's anger blazed against Moses. And he says, here's Aaron coming to meet you. Now, actually, Aaron doesn't leave for weeks. But you're in the middle. You're in the end. He knows, this is my favorite line. Well, I have a few, but, you know, he knows the end from the beginning. He, I know I know the moment Aaron's leaving. Aaron's coming to meet you. Aaron is Moses' brother. And this is what he says to him. I know he can speak well. God is not interested in our abilities. He's interested in the purpose that he designs and calls us to do. Aaron could speak, but he wasn't a prophet, and he wasn't a leader. I know my goodness, there's a little bit of problems later, but that's a whole other message. So that's what the Lord said to me before I started on the message. I, I said, she's been talking for 12 minutes, and she hasn't started yet. No. That's just for you to take home and say, God, what? That's this is a key thing. Write it down. Put it on your phone. I give you permission to take your phone out. What is my disqualifying phrase? Do I have more than one? I can't talk. I, 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 nobody knows me. I'm too old. I'm too young. My hair is straight. My hair is curly. Like, what is it? What is your disqualifying phrase? And even as I'm telling the story, some of you are going like, oh yeah, I tell God this all the time. It's a fraud. Okay, so let's, let's go on to the story because God wanted us to go over this and we're going to understand why again. In Exodus 4, verses 30 to 31, Moses comes back with Aaron. Not just Moses and Aaron, by the way. There's all of the mature Israelites and leaders from every tribe. So when he goes to talk to the people, there's always, you know those Sunday school pictures where it's Moses. It's not. It's Moses, Aaron, and a massive amount of people behind him. He had a support network that said, this man is hearing God, and he's come to tell us what God's saying. Okay? So he talked to the people of Israel, and it says they heard, they believed, and they worshipped. Now that's, those are all verbs. If you don't pay attention to verbs in the Bible, you'll miss things. Yeah. <laughs> is this language arts 30? Yes. Biblical language arts 30. Pay attention to the verbs. Those are all good things. It was a good start. And then Pharaoh, who's been told from birth that he's a god? So we don't understand this. You have to actually understand history and, and study things a little bit. The Egyptians, the Pharaohs were god. He thinks he's god. One of them. Him and frogs. Got to get rid of so he gets a tad riled up at Moses' words. And he does two things. He falsely accuses. That's a verb. Accuses. And he punishes. So then what do the Israelites do? Verb. They scatter all over the place to gather up. Because they were making bricks. They were slave laborers and they had to make bricks. But the Egyptians used to supply their straw to make bricks. And Pharaoh got his nose out of joint and said, you got to go get your own straw, but you got to make as many bricks now as you did before. And he has. So then they get scattered together and they don't make their quota. And now Pharaoh has the foreman, 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 beaten and questioned. Why not? Those are verbs. Got to get the action to the story, okay? Now, this is where it gets really interesting because I never read, read this. Yes, I've read the story probably 30 times. That's my go-to number because of how old I am. More? Probably more. This is coming, this is coming out of Bible now into 2022. Are you ready? Okay. The foreman's response 
was to go to Pharaoh for relief, for answers, and for provision. Did they really think he was their buddy? They dishonored the leadership that God had provided to bring about their deliverance. They just had this time, they're all worshiping together, God's going to deliver us. And when this happens, instead of going to Moses, can you talk to God, this is what happened, and, and we don't think this is what should have happened, but they didn't. They went to Pharaoh. Did you ever think about that before? What were they thinking? So everybody say number one. Number one, it was a foolish decision, it was a foolish action, and they sowed a seed by going to Pharaoh as their source, as their God. And he responds with fake news. You're lazy. This is happening because this, 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 and his stuff starts coming up of his mouth, and it's not true. That's why I call it fake news. Now, when they heard his words, this is what it says, they saw, all of a sudden it went, <gasps> that they were in an evil situation. Really? That's what freaked you off? And then, and then they're just mad. And so they, they're leaving, because Pharaoh's like, get out of here, and they're storming out the door, and they open up the door, and there's Moses and Aaron. Hello? Looking for us? Not. Why not? And so they look. Listen, they look at them, and it says Moses and Aaron were standing in their way. I mean, the timing of God. That was pretty sweet. And the, and the foremen say to them, the Lord look at you and judge you. So they're throwing God. Whoa. You missed it, leadership. For you've made us, you have made us a rotten stench to be detested. Really? Like the Egyptians didn't hate the Israelites already? Come on, come on. It's like, it says, and now they're going to kill us. Like they haven't been killing. This is the reason Moses ended up in the back desert for 40 years is because an Egyptian was killing an Israelite. So he stepped in to stop it and actually killed the Egyptian, and then somebody told, so he ran for his life. After the, the next day, it was two Israelites fighting, so they said, well, are you going to kill one of us? He, tr he tried to, to help, but it wasn't God's way, and it wasn't God's time. They were already killing them. They'd already been killing their babies for decades. Do you think it stopped after Moses got put in the bulrusher? Little arky thing? What's that called? Gosford? Baby boat? <laughs> it did. Did you do do we really think it stopped? They they kept attempting to because it's the same demonic spirit that's over abortion today. It's it has never gone away. So uh, at prayer on Wednesday night, this is actually a thread that God's weaving in here. Because I was like, oh, that's uncomfortable. At prayer on Wednesday night, Noel shared, because as we're praying for things and God moving and miracles in our nation and, and deliverance and all of these kinds of things, he said, he prayed, he said, I just want to share this thought. It's not really, I'm not going to really pray. He said, but as, as we're praying, I was saying, Lord, what has to happen in my life so that I have faith to pray for prison doors to open again? Because Pastors were put in jail. And I'm, and I'm down there going, I pray that. I pray that. A lot. And then, I had a little discussion with, with God, because I'm like, this is not going to happen, is it? And he said, no. When pastors and believers all over Canada are saying, jailed pastors, stop confronting the government. Moses, stop speaking to Pharaoh. Are you seeing this? They're trying to help. You're making us look bad. That was 
all over the place. There were articles written by pastors of this is whatever. I don't have any, you need to look. You need to honor the government and we need to submit and obey and we need to be praying for them. And, and, and that is all true. But the context of it is a godly government that's governing according to how God wants people governed, which is for them to be free. So you can be sure that they were not praying for angels to supernaturally escort those pastors out of prison. Can you see how it mirrors this? That really blew my mind. I was like, oh yeah. Because they were like the people of, of Israel. They were looking, they were looking to Pharaoh. There still is. Okay, back, back to Moses. Okay. So he turns around after they walk away. He goes, Lord, I was obedient. Things are worse. You haven't done what you said you would do. Obedience to God at times is akin to poking the bear in the spirit realm. Stuff starts happening and 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 the devil gets because he knows once you start poking it, he's like, okay, let's see if I can get this to stop, because if it doesn't, we're done. The truth is, he's already done. Because God's already done. Okay. So just so you know. If you're praying for something and it seems to get worse, that's possibly a very good sign. Okay. So then God's answer to Moses is this. I am the Lord. It's like, I'm the Lord Yahweh. And I preached on this about how everything on the earth functions according to sowing and reaping. And this is how come God can say, I'm good. I've given you freedom. This is how it works. You sow good stuff, you're going to reap good stuff. But I'm just. I'm fair, I'm righteous, so if somebody sows something bad, they're going to reap something bad. That's how it works. Everything. The seed goes in, the fruit comes out. So he starts by declaring that. That's very important. He's, he's just. And then he gives Moses a really quick little history lesson. He said, I made myself known as El Shaddai, which means provider, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had revelation of who I was and they prospered. I prospered them. But I didn't make myself known to them in great acts and miracles like I'm about to. Yet they still believed in me. They were sustained, not by the things I did for them, but by their personal relationship with me. Moses got Okay, got it. And then he says this, God says this, I have established my covenant with them. God is a generational God. That's good news. And he said, because I established my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I really want to go somewhere there, and I just don't think I have time. If I do, I'll get to it at the end, but I'm going to just be very self-disciplined and not take that bunny trail. But one of these days, next time we have communion, I will share it. Okay? So if I forget, somebody remind me. Okay. He said, because of that, I've heard their groanings. I've heard the groanings. See, it, it didn't just get bad when Moses showed up. Moses showed up because it had been bad for a long time, and they'd been groaning for a long, long time. He said, I heard their groanings. I remembered my covenant. Therefore, verbs, I will bring you out. I will free you, I will rescue you, I will take you to me relationally, I will be to you a God, no more frogs, certainly not Pharaoh. I will bring you into the land and I will give it to you as a heritage forever, which is why after World War II, Israel became a nation again. Because of Exodus, God said, this is your land, I've taken you back into it and it's yours because I said so. And then he says again, I am the Lord. You have the pledge of my changeless omnipotence, which means all-powerful, and my faithfulness. He's like, I'm giving you my word. I got the power to do this, and I'm going to do what I said. So Moses passes on the message to the Israelites. And it says this, but they, a verb, here we go. She's on a roll this morning. They refused to listen. That's what it says. Refusal is a choice. It tells us why. 
And it's actually interesting because it, it deals with them body, soul, and spirit. Because of their impatience, God, you didn't do it the way I wanted it done or on my timeline. Y'all looking at me like, oh, I never burn that up. Oh my goodness, we do this far oftener, far more often. Than we, <laughs> since we're on grammar this morning, then we realize it's like something, whatever, and we go, Woo! and go, and we all do it. Okay, but impatience, the fruit of impatience, impatience has fruit. It produces, impatience produces stress, anxiety, anger. That was uncomfortable, but right? Anger, negative confessions, and on occasion witchcraft, which is manipulation when we're, we're trying to make something happen because God hasn't done it fast enough or the way I wanted it to, anyone? Avert your eyes. Avoid eye contact. <laughs> He's hitting it hard this morning. Whew. Their impatience, their anguish of spirit. They didn't have this, like, where God could minister to their spirits yet. And so they, it was just when stuff goes on for a long, long time, our spirits just shrivel up and, and our hearts get broken. And then it says, and cruel bondage. It was physically very, very hard for them. So everybody say number two. They sowed the seed of unbelief. What was number one? They made Pharaoh their source, their God. And number two, they, they sowed a seed of unbelief. Now moving on, because God did. He didn't go back and say, oh, it's okay, Moses, tell them again. Oh, here, let me minister to their hearts. He said it, and then he kept doing what he was doing. He didn't try to comfort them. He didn't repeat himself. And he does often. But he didn't. He just started to doing. He just implemented his deliverance plan. And he initiated the first plague, not because Pharaoh whipped the foreman and made them go gather straw. And they whined. Not because they whined and not because it got worse, but because he planned to do it that day. We always think God's reacting to what the devil's doing. He doesn't. The devil has no control over things. That's why he just didn't even deal with it. He's like, okay, I've said this, now I'm starting. And it didn't have anything to do with how the Israelites responded to it. And they responded poorly. So then, in chapter 6, verse 13, God says to Moses, this is a command for the Israelites and Pharaoh. That caught my attention. Because you always think that he's talking to Pharaoh, right? But he says to the Israelites. And then he says to Moses, God will make you, he says, I make you as I am. When you speak, it's like I'm speaking. You're going to declare my will, you're going to declare my purpose, and it could, I just might as well be standing there speaking it. That's really, really important. Because all through scripture, God sends his prophets to speak to kings. All through scripture. He either says, this is good, this is going to happen, or he says, you need to change that, or that's going to happen. And sometimes he just says, this is not going to end well for you. But there's always a prophet that comes and speaks to the leader, the leaders of nations. God hasn't changed that yet. I don't know what that's going to look like in Canada. But it will happen. It will happen. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So keep your eyes peeled. Keep your ears listening. So you go, well, I've got, I'm not a prophet. I, I've got nothing. I don't have the ability to do that. That's okay. Abilities and talents can be for us. I, 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 I don't know how to quite word it, whatever. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter that you're not speaking to the nation because Joshua, who immediately followed Moses as leader, just stood up and he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we have the ability to speak to every one of our own personal situations and it's just like God speaking if we're speaking his words. Okay, God, what do you want, me, what do you want to say to this thing that's bugging me? 
What do you want to say to this situation that's not going well in my life? Okay. And then you say it. We can all do that. Okay. Back in Pharaoh's court, because Moses shows up. And they go, so Moses, uh, you know you're challenging a god. Prove your authority. The devil in the world always wants us to prove our authority by a miracle. So Moses threw down his rod like God taught him in the desert, became a snake. And then the Egypt, Pharaoh's Egyptian sorcerers threw down their rods and they turned into snakes too. So Moses' snake ate their snakes. So then they're like, that's all you got? It's just this chest thumping, you know, posturing. Our God's bigger than your God. So he turns uh, water into blood. And they go, we can do this too. Well, you can in a bowl. It was demonic, but they could do it. He's like, yeah, that's the best you got? He's like, I'm done. He turns around and he walks out. Now, interestingly enough, Herod challenged Jesus with the same words. He'd been beaten. He'd been whipped. He was, he was close to being ready to be crucified. And they... Herod's like, send him over. I need some entertainment. I've heard about this guy. Jesus, come do a miracle for me. Prove that, you know, are you who you say you are? And Jesus didn't answer him. But I know what he's thinking, you idiot. <laughs> That's what he's thinking. Herod challenged him with the same words. Jesus didn't answer. Herod got bored and sent him away. But shortly after, Jesus did prove his authority with the biggest miracle of all time. He took on the sins of the world. So this is what he's standing there in front of Pharaoh going, I'm going to take on the sins of the world. I'm going to freely pay for them with my blood. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to defeat death. And I'm going to rise victorious over everything. That's what's going on in Jesus' head while he's just standing there looking, aw. He's... Yeah, he said, I am about ready to sucker punch the devil. Herod totally missed it. Satan did not. He's like, oh, I'm done. Yes, you are. Our authority is proven by the blood of the Lamb, not by any miracles that do or don't happen. Miracles are awesome, but they're not our source of authority. So, this is why God told me I have to tell this story again, why we have to go back over it. Okay, why did the first three plagues hit the Israelites as well as the Egyptians? Has anybody, could we just read the story and it happened that way? Do we ever go, God, why did you do that? Anybody, just, just humor me. Have you ever thought that? Because seriously, I got a theology degree for whatever that's worth, and I did not think that till this week. So obviously it's not worth that much. Hearing God's voice is. So I'm reading through this, and, that, and he shows me. They went to Pharaoh. They didn't believe God. God is just, and they reaped what they sowed. They, he couldn't turn around and wipe out Egypt and not deal with the sin that Israel had stepped into. It's not just. So number one, they put their trust in Pharaoh, and number two, they rejected the prophetic word of the Lord, and it was a merciful course correction. Do you see, if you're going to go this direction, you're going to stay under this, and everything that happens to the Egyptians is going to happen to you, but I'd really like to get you out of here. Does your heart kind of go like, oh, that makes sense? Because there had to be a reason he did that. And that's the only one that is, from Scripture, principally sound. So, who's your source? This is, this is why God brought up the, the three plagues and then the last seven, and there's going to be a division. But he's asking the body of Christ, who's your source? Is it the government? Because for massive 
amounts of churches all over the world. It is, it was, and it is. And the second thing is, are you going to believe what the Lord is saying? Those two things. When there's a prophetic voice that comes, are you going to heed it? Or are you going to go... Yeah. By the way, it doesn't matter who won the conservative leadership race. It doesn't matter. I don't... Regardless of whether she would win or not, I have a huge issue with pastors and Christians who voted for Pierre because I don't think we can touch abortion right now. It's not the right thing. And if we do whatever, it's like, no, God gave you a person and we needed to vote for someone who says, we're not going to allow people to kill babies anymore. It, it, it's still, if Pierre still would have won, but for the amount of born again Christians that, that voted for him when he is openly pro-abortion, I'm like, I don't care what's going on in the government. You have to stand before God with what you did. And you're like, we're willing to let that go because we're uncomfortable. We don't want it. We're, we're, we don't want to be uncomfortable. And you know, right now with what's going on, you know, there's been stress and there's been financial problems and we've lost our freedoms and all this other stuff. So if we just, if we can just get this conservative right, everything will get turned around and flipped. You don't know that. We don't. This is, this is what God, do we vote? Yes. But only God can deliver Canada. Only God. And this very, very short season is, has been a merciful course correction for the body of Christ. Where are you going to line up? Is your, is, is your source going to be the government or is it going to be God? Are you going to believe the words that the enemy is putting out, or are you going to believe the words of the Lord? And this is where the body of Christ is. Because I just went, I, this is how I shared the word with you, and after that, the body is going to be a separation in the body of Christ. And God said, not exactly. Only if, if I'm their source. If the government is their source, they're standing with Egypt, and they'll get hit. I was like, oh, that's that's not what I said. He said, no, it's not. So you need to correct this. So I don't, I'm, I'm just like, can we just share this all over the world? So people can make a choice. People can make a decision. Where will you line up? So this is, and then this is what Moses, um, he communicates from God. And God's talking to Pharaoh and he says, because this is really important. This is why it says it doesn't matter who wins any election. Because this is what God says to Pharaoh. For this purpose have I let you live. That I might show you my power and that my name may be declared throughout the earth. God has not changed. Any, any government leaders have been flipping. Things have been changing. Sometimes we think, oh, that was a better one. And then in New York we found out, oh, no, that was worse. And, and you just look at what happened. The queen died. Things are shifting in the spirit realm. And, and there's, <laughs> it wasn't the video I, I knew where Prince Charles is standing there saying, and we will listen to what, it, there's a thing where he's at the World Economic Forum and Davis thing and he's speaking and he's like saying, he's, and it's really clear. I said, Brent, I lost it. Do you ever think I should save all these things for Facebook and then I got too much? So you can, yeah, it was one of those things. And he basically very clearly in his speech says, says to, to Satan, we will do what you tell us to do. The one who's here, who we can't all see, we will obey him. It was clear. And then he's going like, okay, and if we don't deal with climate change, there's going to be wars and more pandemics. This is what happens when we don't teach, oh, what's it called, in school. Common sense. I taught my kids as I was working. Logic! Logic! <laughs> oh my God, why I got to let that go? <laughs> but does your head not spin with that statement? In other words, if, because this is what he was actually saying. If you guys don't bow down to the God of climate change, we're going to lose another pandemic and we're going to start a whole bunch of wars. That's, that's what he was saying. Oh! 
That's not what he said, but that's what he was saying. Moving right along. So I want to I want to I want to take a minute to talk about the locusts because before they were loosed, Pharaoh's leadership team approached him with a strategy. He wasn't in this alone. And they said, do you not yet know and understand that Egypt is destroyed? Because he was just, God had hardened his heart so much. It was, it, was like a, it was a God thing. It was a satanic thing going on in the spirit realm. Where I am not backing down and letting this God who Moses said whatever take away my entire workforce. It would be like taking away all of the oil and natural gas out of Europe and it's going dark this winter. They were he was, he was like, no, I am not letting them go. And he, the, the land's destroyed. Let's just, this is what they said to him, make a compromise. He didn't come up with that, his team did. Just let the men go. That's brilliant. Because they'll come back to get their wives and kids. So we win, win, win. Are you serious? So that leaves all the women and the children vulnerable. Let's just get rid of the men. This is the first place where this is really clear, this demonic strategy from the devil. It's a compromise. When, they, when the devil tried to erase men, or just, just go do your thing, all the women and children were left vulnerable. I want to rename our church, by the way. If you're a man, come here. <laughs> it's not really catchy. But God's looking for man. Yeah. Not catchy? We'll work. We'll work on it. Man wanted. Man wanted. <laughs> but, but listen to the heart of it. Man wanted. Man wanted. Yeah. Okay. So so that was a bit of an issue. We have to watch. There's going to be attempts at compromise. So just open your eyes and say, what is this? Is this a compromise? You can open your churches, but you just have to do this. You can't sing, which means you can't worship, which is why we gather. There's compromise everywhere. So we should be familiar with this, and we should spot it right away. Okay, next was the hail, and there was a division with the people of Egypt at that time, those who feared the word of the Lord and those who sneered and ignored it. God said, I'm going to send hail. It's going to heal. kill all your cattle and all your animals that are in the field. So if you don't want them to die, put them under shelter. And believe it or not, some of the Egyptians went, I've been watching how this going. I'm going with the God guy. Don't tell Pharaoh when I put my cows in the barn tonight. Th those hailstones killed all the vegetables. Anything that was growing killed them all. Killed all the animals in the field. Any man that were running out thinking, oh, I should have done this before, and went to get their cows, got killed. Trees were knocked down with the hail. Them some big stones, man. I don't know what it was, because it wasn't, it, and this is the thing. It went, because God is just, it just went on all the borders of Egypt, except where the Israelites were. It didn't go to the country there. It didn't go there. It didn't start 10 feet in. It went from one border to the other border, and that's what it did. But God said, if you'll listen to me, I'll save your animals because your leader's doing something really stupid right now. I have said stupid twice in idiot months. I don't know. Okay. I mean, if he cared about saving the cattle, but we have to understand as we're coming into this new season, God cares about the hearts of men and women. And, and there's going to be a massive, and we've already begun to see a little bit of it. There's going to be a great season of harvest. There's going to be a time where people are going to turn around and say, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, I ignored this. Yeah, I called it conspiracy theory. Yeah, I called it this. It's like, oh, I thought, oh, the government would never do that because we would never do that. So we think other people wouldn't. It's, it's a blessing to be naive, but it's got, you know, another side to it. 
is dangerous to be naive. So, so that's coming. The season of harvest is coming. And then I just want to talk really, really quickly about the darkness. Because if I was there, this is what, because uh, who's seen the movie, The Exodus? And they're all, they're in their little houses and there's little lamps burning, but it's dark outside. Even in the garden. Excuse me. There's no lamp. I don't know if they couldn't find their matches. I don't know if there was coals. There was no coals. There was no lights. There was no lamps burning. If they went to light a match, it wasn't going to light because God said 100% darkness. So it, we think they had little lights, but it was dark during the day. It was normal, day and light, with stars, mm, harvest moon, and all of this other stuff for, for the Israelites. But for three days, 72 hours, it was complete darkness, can't see anything. They plopped down where they were and didn't, but they might have tried to crawl. Where's my house? Honey, where are you? Melt to the lab. Who's got the kids? It was dark. So this is Charlene. And I don't know whether God would have let me do this or not, but I would have wanted, because there's a line. Total darkness, light. And I would have gone, and I would have put my nose right up to the line, and I would have gone dark. Light, dark, light. This is cool. Come here, Brent. Come and see this. This is like, this. I can tell where the border to Egypt is. I'm straddling it. It's just, are you surprised? No. That's telling me something she'd do. Because just like that, I'm walking in and I'm in the light. Okay, so finally, this is really interesting. The only plague that God told Moses about ahead of time at the very beginning, when he's talking to them in the desert, he says, I'm going to kill their firstborn. I, you tell Pharaoh I'm going to kill his firstborn. That's actually the last plague. It doesn't say that he told them about any of the others. But he told them how that he was going to do that. And he said, because Israel is my firstborn. So you look at this, and in Abraham was, G was Jesus. Genetically, Jesus was in Abraham. So he's like, you're messing with my son. I'm going to mess with yours. So, here we go. It's time for the body of Christ. I bolded this bold print here. Big point. It's time for the body of Christ to stop trusting in everything else and get under the blood of Jesus. Frogs are hard to recognize sometimes. Until I just sat and started chatting about that thing where Moses said to him and God got so upset. And he said, and it controlled his life. This is why we need to give our lives to Christ. Because God wants to give us freedom and freedom to obey him. So anything else that's not God, that's controlling us, is an idol. So our thoughts can be idols. And that really, that just took it to a new level. Because we go like, oh, and we'll be what we worship money, or we worship power, or we worship influence. In North America, our idols are harder to see than in other countries, because we're so intellectual. We think. So I felt like the Lord said, just call them to personal repentance. We have to sit down and all week I'm like, show me my frogs, God. I don't want any frogs. What's my disqualifying phrase? What's my disqualifying phrase? And then corporately, there needs to be a corporate repentance of the whole church, but and and Brett and I talked about this last night. We did we did deal with this in prayer. We repented, we went before the throne of heaven, and we repented in the courts of heaven and said, "God, you know, we were we 
as we began to walk through the whole COVID scene, it's like, okay, you know, we can do this for two weeks, we can do whatever, and we trying to be accommodating, trying to be loving. It's like, well, if somebody comes in that's not safe and have a, and we don't have masks on, they'll say, we don't care, we don't love. And so we don't want to offend anybody and stop them from coming to the Lord. And it sounds really good. But this is where this is where God this is what God said to me. He challenged me a few days ago with how we responded to the early days of what was a worldwide strategic demonic attack. It was not disease and death. That's what it got called, that's what it got labeled. But it was about dominance. We, yes, we'll kill some people. We don't care about that. But the ones that live will be able to dominate them. And this was the agenda. It's the Antichrist agenda because he wants he wants to shift things to happen. We talked about this ahead of time. And God's like, you know, you don't get to control anything. I do. I control the timeline. So the sickness was just the weapon to achieve dominance. And I think we all know that. It just, it just needs to be said. And we did not, as leadership, get on our faces before the Lord. There was nothing else to do. We were all locked up in our houses. It would have been a great two weeks to kind of fast and pray. We listened to what's going on. We listened to voice, prophetic voices, and it was really clear. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, I'll heal their land. That was everywhere. But it's like, okay, God, what do you want us to do here in a local church? Because if God had showed us, if we'd have gone and listened, and we didn't get a clear, direct word from the Lord, because we didn't ask for one. As things came up, different scenarios came up, we prayed about that, what should we do? And I'm the prophetic voice for this. I'm the prophetic head of this. And I didn't call for it. So I had I have to prepare. And I'm publicly repenting. What would it look like? It might have looked like exactly the same, but we'd have known. Now we don't know. Was it, it's like eventually we got to the point where we're like, oh uh, yeah, no, this is this is corrupt. We're we're gonna give people a freedom to choose. We're not, we're not sitting six feet apart, eight rows back. Come and be the body. We let people decide what to do. But we, we made a few fear-based decisions that we painted over with a safe shade of it's wise. It's wisdom. This is our only building. You know, if they, they find some, uh, the church in PA, I think, 140 some thousand dollars. <laughs> Bill, how much you got in the account? Not that much. <laughs> Ever, I don't think. It's like, no. And so we're like, well, but see, if God had showed us, and you know, like he, he speaks fairly clearly to us. I could, I could see God showing Noel, because he sees pictures like nobody else I know, where this thing came out of an envelope that he stamped, no payment required on it. Because now we know everything got thrown out in court. But here's the thing, if, if, if we have, as, as a leadership team said, we forgot this is not what it looks like, and we're not shutting down church, and we're going to stand for the Lord, would there have been an anointing and blessings on that? We don't know because we didn't walk through it. But, but I do know this, it would have been up to everybody to decide if they were going to come to church. So the question is, we're back to where what I preached today. Would you have listened to the government or would you have listened to God? There are people that stopped going to church. There are people here that have had, still have not come back to church. And I don't know if they ever will, and I don't care. They know the Lord. I'm interested in leading people to the Lord and setting people free. We did reach a lot of people online. But the fruit of that hasn't manifested yet. There's two really specific testimonies, but they were personal relationships we had. God could have done that without us being online. You know what else he said to me? He said, the church kind of enjoyed it because you guys were all tired. Y'all got to sleep in on Sunday morning. You could stay in your jammies for church. 
it's like the church collectively went, because <sighs> we were so busy that it felt good to have to stay home. So we could try to rationalize away this merciful co correction, but I can't. He said, Charlene, you, you guys didn't fast and pray and ask me, what do you want our church to do? So I'm asking for forgiveness. And many of you have moved here since then, so you don't even know. <laughs> it's like, oh, what happened? But that's okay. We did not ask. We will not do that again. We will not close our doors. We will not cover our faces. You can do what you want, but we're going to worship. And I don't know what the strategy is going to be. I think they pretty well figured out that we could try to do this again and suck them back into the vortex of fear, but people aren't going to go. So it's, it's probably going to look like something else. So I just want to address fear for a second. And, and I really, my heart became really compassionate for moms, particularly moms with little kids. If you're afraid of dying, and I just, I mean that really respectfully, and it's hard when your kids are little, it's like, God, i got to be there for my kids. I don't know what Moses' mom felt like when she sh shifted him off in that basket. Mm -hmm. She lost total control of the whole situation, except to pray. And the thing is, sometimes it's like people raise their kids and then stuff happens. Like it, At some point in time, we have to lay them down and give them to, give them to me. My days are in your hands. But I do, I, I'm just trying to say that's a whole new season of trusting to not be afraid of dying when your children are like young. So I just want to respectfully say that. But if we're afraid of dying and if we're afraid of any other outcomes, I'll lose my job, I'll lose my friends, I'll lose my family, I'll lose whatever, people will yell at me. I'll get Karen in the restaurant, like I, whatever it is. This is what I heard the Lord say, either they aren't fully saved you just said that to your congregation? Yes, I did. Anybody else listening? It's like, I asked Jesus into my heart, but my mind's not saved because I'm afraid of dying. The, the early church, I mean, they just killed Jesus. Did they think they were going to be nicer to, to them? They had no fear of dying. And God added 3,000 on a Sunday. That was a good Sunday. He said, or they've not yet read the Bible. Because it's really clear. God, I lay it all down for you. My life's in your hands. You can raise me up again. You can do anything. But I'm living without fear of anything. Because, because of what God wants to do and what he's going to do, we need to decide what we're going to do. And that's the only thing that matters. I was a little worried about sharing this. There is no not sharing it. You know that by now. But we have to decide who our source is and what we're going to do with the prophetic when it comes. Because we know this season is coming, but I don't know what God's going to do. But I feel very strongly it's going to be like, you know, nobody since the time of Moses has seen my hand move like this on the earth and I'm going to do it in every nation I'm going to do it in every nation because if he doesn't we're done if you're not aware of what's going on around the world if God doesn't set us free we're done so if that's the case you need to lead as many people to the Lord as you can he's not done there's a big deliverance coming there's a big deliverance. Because the church doesn't look like God said his church is going to look like when he's coming back for her. We're cute in places, but we're not a beautiful bride. Okay. So this is the thing that God told me last week at the beginning. And I felt this morning that I just needed to sit on, on this one thing. So I'm going to share it tomorrow, uh, next week. Um, it's about my backyard makeover. Because <laughs> I'm like, God, this is just amazing. And he said, yeah. And then he started to talk to me. Because I could see it. I could see what he was saying. So I just have to wait for that. Can you wait for it? 
All right. I'm going to ask you to deal with this personally, but then I'm going to ask you to deal with it as families because we have to be on the same page. We have to be on the same page as family units, as for me and my house. So we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, ooh, you love us so much. You always tell us when we're messing up so that we can repent, which means just turn and change or to just shift so that we're right in the center of where we need to be so that your blessings and your goodness and your protection can protect us so that your provision is there. And so, Father, we just ask uh, for a ruthless willingness to search our hearts, to tell ourselves the truth, and to identify anything that would put us in the camp we don't want to be in. And Father, we thank you for the clarity of this word. And I thank you, God, that it sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen.